Good evening and welcome to another in the series, Get the Facts. I am your host, William Neal, and of course, this is our pre-independence show. The 28th of September, we want to wish you and yours all the best. And of course, this is a reminder that COVID is real and we've got to do the right thing. This show is a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Wellness and this station, Channel 5. Remember, it's also an interactive show. And tonight I'm in the studios by myself, but I will be joined by some experts from the Carl Huchner Memorial Hospital, and they'll be joining me by Zoom. But that does not mean that you don't get the opportunity to still ask your questions. Of course, as a part of our normal setup for tonight, we start off by giving you the COVID numbers for the last week, from last Monday, the 13th, to tonight, September 20. Let's go with our numbers. Our numbers. Total tests reported, 11,855. Total positive cases reported, 1,498. Total deaths, 18. Condolences to all the families who lost loved ones due to COVID. Our vaccination data from September 13 to tonight, the 20th, for 2021. Total vaccinated for the week, 5,070. Total single vaccinated for the week, 9,000. 574. Total fully vaccinated for the week, 14,644. Our cumulative data stands at total vaccinated, 180,176. Total fully vaccinated, 95,523. Total vaccination for children ages 12 through 17, 18,842. Those are our statistics for the past week. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the KHMH's responses, response to the third wave of COVID-19. Remember, you can submit your questions via our Facebook live stream or by simply sending a message that says hashtag get the facts. Now, we're getting ready to move into our first segment for tonight. And we have all our panelists via Zoom. They are Dr. Eric Bradley, who is the internist and lead doctor for the KHMH COVID unit. We have Dr. Selma Bermudez, epidemiologist, also from the KHMH. And we have Bertha Gonzalez, respiratory therapist from KHMH. Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Now, I want to start off at the very, very top by just asking the panel to share from your perspective your view of exactly what uh, your role is at the KHMH and how do you assist in fighting COVID, especially during this third wave. I'm Dr. Eric Bradley. I am an internist, one of the head doctors of the COVID unit, along with Dr. Yanessi Cruz, who is our emergency medicine specialist. She also is a head doctor in the unit. We do the daily assessments of the patients admitted to the COVID unit, doing rounds, intervening in the patients who need critical care, also patients who need moderate um, care due to the COVID-19 infections. Dr. Good night. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Sorry. 
My name is um, Bertha, and I'm the respiratory therapist here at KHMH. Um, my job is to be a part of the of the team by observing the patient that is mechanically ventilated and um, assisting in keeping the airway patent. So um, I'm basically there to go and look at the patient, assess the patient, and make sure that the ventilator is working properly, that the patient is um, breathing in accord with what um, the doctors want to have set on the machine. So. All right, thank you very much, Bertha. And Dr. Bermudez? Good night, Dr. Selma Bermudez. I am Carl Krishna's epidemiologist. Um, my job description basically um, is to keep track of all admitted cases that we have that comes through Krakushna. We all, I also am responsible for any patient that comes to Krakushna and get tested. I would usually call them to give them their result, whether it's positive or negative. I send reports daily to the Ministry of Health and the um, Central Health Region and um, follow up on the cases, whether they're vaccinated or not. Now, Dr. Bermudez, when did we actually start seeing a spike in the cases at the KHMH? When did people start coming in, in numbers? And can you kind of give me a little idea of the window um, when that started to happen and how effective um, you've been in dealing with the increased numbers? Okay, so we start seeing the, the uh, increase in cases uh, towards the end of July, early August, um, up, to, up to now. So for the month of August, we had seen uh, 61 admissions. And um, out of that 61 admission, we have had in August 19 deaths. Um, in that month also, we have seen some admission of children, but uh, they were not severe, severely ill, so they got treated and were released. What, what were the ages you're talking about with regards to the children themselves? Um, we had uh, six weeks, a five month, and a 12 year old. In August. That okay. Ready. Yes. Um, in that also, we, we have been seeing a lot of um, maternity cases, pregnant women. Um, we have seen eight cases in August, and from that amount, we have had two deaths in August. Wow. Um, what are the numbers go, looking like for September? Today, we are at the 20th of September, and to date, we have had 84 admissions. Just for the month of September? Yes, up to today's date. Okay. 84 admissions. And the deaths and the age ranges that we've seen in okay, that? Okay, yeah. The deaths so far is 22. We have 22 deaths. Um, the youngest being 20, a 20 year old passed away. Yesterday. Wow. And it goes up to the 90s. Now, let me just single out, for example, the 20 year old. Did, did okay. he or she have underlying conditions or anything that would make the case more difficult? No, there was no comorbidities, but he was not vaccinated. Um, he spent about 21 days hospitalized, he was ventilated, and uh, he passed away yesterday, sadly. Hmm. Now, you mentioned just now that he was unvaccinated, and of course, condolences to the family. Um, what are the numbers showing in terms of vaccinated and unvaccinated, in terms of who being admitted to the hospital? Okay, sure. Um, for the month of August, in, with that 61 cases, out of that we had three cases that were fully vaccinated, 13 with first dose, and 45 not vaccinated. From the 84 for September, 
13 with first dose, 10 fully vaccinated, and 61 not vaccinated. Now, let me just go to Dr. Bradley for a minute because I understand that it has become so hectic that you have practically taken up residence at the uh, KHMH, meaning that you actually live there. Um, how prepared was the KHMH to handle this spike? And what ha about it has uh, prompted the need for you to basically stay there as many hours as possible? Okay. Uh, before I address that question, I just want to um, follow up on something that Dr. Bermuda sure. mentioned when it comes to the vaccination status of the patients. I think we, we need to move away from defining someone as one dose. Um, you're vaccinated when you have your two doses. Um, if it's Johnson & Johnson, well, one dose plus the two weeks. So we start, we need to move away from saying, okay, I have one dose, this person has one dose because you're not protected until you have your two, if it's, um, if it's AstraZeneca or Pfizer, you're not protected until you have your two doses plus the two weeks. If it's Johnson & Johnson, you're not protected until you have your, your single dose plus the two weeks. So we need to move away from this one dose because I think people uh, think that they're safe just with one dose. They're not because as Dr. Bermudez has, has clearly mentioned, we've had so many patients with just um, one dose and we see that they develop severe disease also. So we do need to move away from that. Um, over the past month, it has been very, um, very hectic with the increase in numbers. Um, once again, I, I need to mention the name of Dr. Ian Esikros, who is also a very important player as a part, as a, as a head of the unit also. Unfortunately, she could not be here with us tonight. Um, so we work hand in hand in treating, in dealing with these um, with these patients. We're at a critical point at this time. Um, I can speak as of 7 p.m. Tonight in the unit, we have 19 patients, 19 COVID positive patients. And so people can be aware, aware or a capacity or a bed capacity is 23 beds. So we are nearing capacity. I think about a week or two ago, um, we actually had 30 patients for a 23 bed unit. Now, how does that work? We also have the PUI unit, which is a person's under investigation. So on a daily basis, and um, like I said with Dr. Cruz, along with Dr. Delaboma, the, the head nurse of the COVID unit, we literally have been juggling where to put some of these patients. We try to avoid having patients outside waiting, but it, we're at a critical point right now. If people do not adhere to regulations, um, we may reach a point that unfortunately our neighboring countries are seeing where we don't have space to put the patients. Where patients who come in may need to sit on a chair, may need to put a cardboard box on the ground, waiting for a bed to become available. So that is where we are right now with this uh, with this search. Now, um, you're saying about the need for increased space, but you're not just talking about pitching a bed. So it's not as if though if I am ill at this point, I can come with a cot, let's say, um, because that's the space that you'll need. You're talking about also having access to the medical professionals to make sure that um, your vitals are being monitored, etc. Yes, it's not only the physical space, but also equipment, also personnel. Ms. Berta, who is here, for example, she plays a very important role in, in, the, in helping manage, managing these patients, but she's the only respiratory therapist we have. And sometimes we call on her on weekends at 2 a.m. to help us with that difficult case. So it's not only needing physical space, we need the personnel, the medical officers who play an important role in the care of these patients also, the nurses, the PCAs, the attendants. You know, and also with more, if we do get more physical space, more beds obviously, we need also more equipment to treat these patients and more medications. Now, one of the things that I um, used as a preamble into the conversation for tonight with you, Dr. Bradley, I've 
been mentioning about you actually feeling the need to remain at the hospital. Um, how, uh, what does that mean for you as an individual? And how does that help you better um, participate in, the, in taking care of those who are being um, impacted at this point? And why do you think that it's necessary for you to do that? How about the toll on your physical body and also the fatigue factor? We're here for the patients. We try to do the best for our patients. So we do have a responsibility to take care of our patients. That's why we spend countless hours here doing everything we possibly can until the last breath that these patients take. Um, but we need the public to help us also. And the public can do their part once again. And I know it, I'm repeating it, but once again, adhering to protocols getting vaccinated. I mean, at this point, there's no need to having to have baby showers, to have birthday, par birthday parties. I mean, what you need to do is you need to stay at home just with your immediate family. You want to see your friend, you know what? You have FaceTime. There's so many ways that we can interact now, but now this is not the time for you to be socializing. This is a time for you to do your part to to help us, to help these patients. All right. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when I come back, one of the things that I want to get into, and I think this is a great opportunity to talk um, with Berta a little bit more about what exactly does it mean uh, as a respiratory therapist. Um, at what point do you decide, for example, along with the attending physician, of course, to actually intubate someone. So we're going to go ahead and take a break, but when we come back, we want to look at the breathing aspect of this disease and how it impacts people and how the treatment itself progresses. Don't go anywhere. Get the facts continues after these messages. The life you save can be yours. This is a message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. At Belize Diagnostic Center, we offer FDA-approved PCR testing for COVID-19. Get your results as quickly as one hour. Don't risk getting exposed to COVID-19 by going elsewhere. We take appointments or we can come to your home or office using our concierge service with no additional fees. We have 10 locations countrywide. Call or WhatsApp us at 613-TEST, that is 613-8378, to schedule your test today. With the rise in COVID cases and youths being infected, it is time to be safe and stay safe with SAFE, Sanitization and Fumigation of Environments. Let our professionally trained and certified team be your solution to a clean, healthier, and safe environment for your home or business. For more information, call our WhatsApp 613-0222 or visit us at 2.5 Miles Philip Golson Highway beside Friendship Restaurant. Choose the one you can trust. Choose safe. 
save, save, save. The credit union way. Member save, owners are encouraged save, to save regularly, borrow wisely, and repay promptly. No use keeping the money in your pocket. Soon as you turn wrong, you know you ain't got it. So as money goes from hand to hand, give your cash to the umbrella man. I tell him you save, save, save. The credit union way. As Belize continues to shield its people from the worst ravages of this pandemic, we must continue to keep our country safe by ensuring reliable supply chains for critical components for the fight ahead. Belize's oxygen supply is safe with 300% more oxygen supply in country than is necessary. However, Fabregas continues to make our oxygen supply chain even more robust and responsive to a potential worst-case scenario. Through supply arrangements established and secured by Fabregas, our country can receive critical life-saving oxygen from five regional neighbors in Mexico and Central America through marine and or land transportation. So, in addition, Fabregas has secured additional reliable sources of life-saving oxygen using a diversity of transportation modes and countries of origin. Fabregas, Belize Limited. We got your back. How does the AstraZeneca vaccine work? The vaccine provides support to help your body develop immunity to the virus that causes COVID-19. The body is left with a supply of memory cells that will remember how to fight the virus. It takes a few weeks for the body to produce the antibodies after vaccination. How long does it take to build immunity after taking the first dose of the vaccine? There is protection 14 days after a person's first dose. However, that initial protection may decline over time, which is the reason why it is so important to get the second shot. How long after the first dose should one take the second dose? The second dose should be given between week 8 and week 12. Are there any deaths associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine? There have been no deaths associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Vaccines save lives. They remain the safest, most effective and cost-effective medical tool developed. Increased uptake of the vaccine is the best way to stop this pandemic, save lives and return to normalcy. Welcome back to our second segment for Get the Fact. Of course, we encourage you to send in your questions. Remember, this is an interactive show. In our first segment, we looked at the demographics and the deaths that we've had over the last two months since the spike in cases started. In this segment, we want to be looking at the treatment that, uh, or treating a patient at the COVID unit. So before the break, I asked Berta as the uh, respiratory therapist to let's start talking a little bit about breathing and how do you control that given the fact that uh, this is one of the more difficult aspects to um, control when it comes to uh, the patients. So let's start there with Berta talking about breathing. Um, at what point do you get involved in the entire treatment for a COVID patient? Okay, um, when a patient comes to the hospital, they, um, they are taken you know, to triage and the nurse examines the patient, checks the oxygen, saturation, the pulse, all the vitals, right? So um, at that point, they would have to um, notice and see if the oxygen is at that below 94%, then the patient will be placed on oxygen. Usually we call these um, low devices, right? Low oxygen devices. Um, the first one would be a nasal cannula. So um, what happens is that the nasal cannula will give you a percentage of oxygen between um, 
all, up, all the way up to six liters. Okay, so normally right now we're breathing 21% of oxygen that is in the air. But once placed on oxygen, you can go from 24% and um, the canal out will give you extra amount depending on how much um, the saturation is that will go rising as well, right? So um, normally what happens with the, with the nasal cannula is since the patient, when they come here, more than likely they will already have some type of respiratory distress, right? So they're breathing in and they're breathing what we would call heavy, okay? So they need a lot of flow to um, be able to, to get in the amount of oxygen that they need. So when we notice that the cannula is not enough, then we would have to go and place them on, on a mask, um, usually what we call a non-rebreather mask. So um, this one would go all the way up to 15 liters. But um, as I said before, that the patient would have um, um, some problem breathing, meaning they would need a lot of, of flow than what we would require on a normal basis because they're fighting to get the amount of oxygen to circulate. So um, at this point, your heart is beating faster, you're, you're trying to get the air to reach all the organs, right? So eventually, when um, COVID starts to set in and your lungs become more inflamed and you have a lot of liquids in the, in the, all the way down in the alveoli, you could look at the lungs like maybe an upside down tree, right? Mm -hmm. So the leaves would be all the way in the last part of the, of the lungs. So these are the ones that would end up getting inflamed and um, they would get, like when you hit yourself, for example, it swells up, right? Sometimes you might have oozing in your in in your hand, for example, if you if you hit your hand. The same thing happens down there, right? So all that inflammation and all the oozing prevents the oxygen from going around and circulating. So eventually, the 15 liters, at that point you might not you might need 30 liters. So what happens is since the low devices cannot give you the, the amount that you need, then we have to place you on a machine, which is called a high flow um, machine, right? It's a heated high flow machine. So it basically has um, some little prongs that are placed in the nose, and this can go all the way up to 60 liters, or the, the machine that we have goes all the way up to 80 liters. A patient that is in real, you know, like a lot of distress would need all the way up to 120 liters. Wow. And this high flow then will not be able to help. So the only next thing would be a mechanical ventilator. So for this, the patient can't be awake. The um, doctor would end up have to tell the nurse, you know, we need to give medications and the patient is sedated and is put to sleep so that the body can rest, the lungs can you know, the inflammation can be treated um, and the patient um, would be able to rest and hopefully recover, no? And that's the intubated um, patient that you'd have at that time? Yes, they put a tube down your, your throat, basically, and then the machine, what it does, it pumps air into the lungs. So it basically breathes for you. We're going to give you... Um, a volume, right? We're going to give you a respiratory rate. So basically you're, you're sedated, your muscles are, are relaxed, so you're not doing anything. The machine is doing everything for you when it comes to, um, with regards to breathing, no? Taking in oxygen and getting rid of the carbon dioxide. Now, I, I want to ask the doctors, um, is the distress breathing the only factor that determines uh, when someone gets intubated or what are the factors that make that determination, um, you know, a last resort um, at that point? Yes, besides the distress breathing, um, like what Ms. Berta was mentioning, we also look at the saturation levels, which is basically the percentage of oxygen in the patient's system. So once we're on the maximum of high flow, 
and the patient is with respiratory distress, but we also know that the patient is hypoxemic, basically meaning that their oxygen levels are low. That is another that is another factor we take into consideration to intubate patients. Also, what we call their neurological status, due to the fact that the patient is not receiving enough oxygen, there is less oxygen transport to the brain. So the patient can become what we call encephalopathic, just basically meaning that they have low oxygen amounts in the brain, so they become disoriented. So those are some of the factors that we take into consideration when we need to intubate a, a patient. And it's we try to do everything we possibly can, but when the patient reaches a certain point um, that they cannot breathe on their own, that is when we, we need to take the decision to intubate because like what Ms. Berta is mentioning, the inflammation of the lungs is so, is so, so severe. Now, as a follow up to that, most people in the public domain, the minute they hear, you know, a family member um, is intubated, they assume the worst. Is it uh, the last, uh, a last ditched effort um, to really save someone and most people are not going to um, be able to recover from that? The truth is that the mortality rate for patients who are intubated is high. Right, and something that you can do to to um, prevent being intubated is simply getting vaccinated. Now, let's let's talk a little bit about um, over the weekend. We saw that there was a post that says uh, the KHMH is full to capacity, um, and what does that mean um, besides dealing with the COVID cases? What does that mean when you say that it is full to the capacity? Of course, most people have been um, seeing images of field hospitals. Would that be, um, and, I, and I also want to, my mind is racing, I also want to go back to triaging and how do you get to that point and how do you decide who you're going to um, treat first? Okay, when we say Full to capacity. Um, what the public needs to realize is that we, along with the COVID unit that we are running right next to the COVID units, is what we call the PUI unit, which means persons under investigation. So we also have persons who are coming with respiratory symptoms, with fever, uh, with gastrointestinal symptoms. So these patients are highly suspected to have COVID. Um, while we wait for the result of either a rapid test or a PCR, these, pa these persons need to be placed in a, in a certain unit because we cannot put them in the, with the general public. So they're placed in the PUI unit, um, which also has a certain capacity of nine beds. As of 7 p.m., we had five patients who were considered PUI waiting for, waiting for a result. So, and sometimes, like I had mentioned previously, because of spacing, if we have an overflow of COVID patients, we would um, use some of the same rooms that we use for the PUI patients. So that is when we run into trouble and we don't have enough space to place everyone. Now, um, I also asked you um, just now about triaging. How exactly does that work? Because you're talking about those who are still awaiting the tests. So you have a special room for them. But once someone is showing uh, some form of distress with breathing, um, what are the levels that you have there to determine that they will be um, ad admitted into the um, COVID unit itself? Okay. When it comes to triaging, well, we do have a, a, a triage nurse, and they would call us to let us know that there is a, there's a patient with for example, gastrointestinal symptoms or respiratory symptoms if the patient has low saturation. So when it comes to who we take up, we should take up the patients who are most critical. If, we, if I have three people waiting outside and I have a patient with just generalized body ache, maybe a mild fever, I have a second patient who is mildly hydrated with diarrhea, and I have a third patient who is with low saturation, 
and a nurse tells me that the patient is respiratory, in respiratory distress, obviously the patient with, who is most critical, that's the patient that we would take, um, take up first. So we do have different triage levels and when the unit is full, these are decisions and sometimes these are hard decisions that we have to make because we have to, to decide which patient we're going to take up first based on, on bed capacity. Now, and, and this goes for any member of the panel itself. Now, we've also been introduced to this idea of there's also COVID pneumonia. How is that different from um, the regular pneumonia? And how do you detect that as opposed to um, pneumonia itself? Well, the COVID pneumonia just basically means that it's a it's the pneumonia secondary to the to the virus that causes um, COVID. Um, it's a viral pneumonia as compared to what people regularly know as a bacterial pneumonia. And the issue with the COVID pneumonia or this viral pneumonia is, yes, we do have therapies that we call supportive care. Unfortunately, there's no cure, um, and that is something that also the public needs to be aware of. Um, there are certain medications that we use to try to slow down the how fast the virus is replicating in the lungs, some medications that we use to try to prevent the formation of blood clots, medications that try to slow down um, the inflammation, but there's no, there's no treatment per se that can cure COVID or cure a COVID pneumonia. Now, you're also the, the national referral hospital. How do you um, deal with those uh, people who are now coming in from outside uh, Belize district and Belize city itself? Once again, it comes to comes down to spacing. We are the tertiary level, the only tertiary level hospital in, in the country. So we do have direct communication or the regional hospitals do have direct communications with us when they need to, to refer patients. I do know this weekend, um, because of the, the capacity that we had, the regions needed to be informed of how we were because there can come a point that we are unable to, to take or accept patients once again because we don't have the, the space. Now, I want to go back to something that was said earlier. There was a 20-year-old that died yesterday. And you said um, he had been um, in the hospital for 21 days. Uh, does your risk actually increase um, when you're hospitalized for an extended period of time, let's say past a week or so? And at which point uh, do you actually... Uh, do all that you can, including intubation. We do all that we can until the last breath of the patient. So if you're hospitalized um, for an extended period of, of time, it doesn't mean that you necessarily immediately you, to be hospitalized that you go on um, the mechanical um, ventilator. So what is the progression there? And does uh, the length of your stay impact also your chances of survival? Well, we have different levels of patients. Um, like, for example, what Ms. Berta was mentioning, we have patients who have mild to moderate diseases who may just need to be on supplementary oxygen at low doses. We have patients with moderate to severe disease who go on the high flow nasal cannula, and they, we do have patients who have recovered and we slowly get them off of the oxygen and we are able to, to discharge them. Unfortunately, when the inflammation is so severe in the in the, the lungs, these are the patients that go on the mechanical ventilation, the, the mechanical ventilation, and uh, the chances of survival, yes, are, are low. So it all depends on how severe and on the progression of the disease itself. Now, I know that pregnant women are also a major concern. Um, we do have the Pfizer um, that I think is now cleared for um, pregnant women. But what are we seeing in terms of uh, pregnant women and COVID that, is, that may be worrisome for you at the KHMH? 
first thing with the with the pregnant women that have been admitted for the past two months, none of them have been vaccinated. So that's one problem right there. And given the fact that you have all the difficulties with breeding, etc., how is that intensified when a woman is pregnant? Yes, the pregnancy, the, the, the pregnancy itself can um, can complicate it even um, even more when we do have patients who are pregnant and who have a, a COVID pneumonia. Um, Unfortunately, there's some treatments that we cannot use in in um, in pregnancy. So that's something that's that's important to to note also because we're not only thinking about the life of the the mother, but also the life of the unborn child. Um, we are seeing, and it's actually scary. We are seeing more and more pregnant um, females being admitted to the to the unit. It is something very scary, and it's also it's also sad. Um, I think well, anyone should be very cognizant of the the seriousness of this disease, especially if you're pregnant or if your your wife is pregnant. I mean, you really need to take your your necessary precautions around pregnant women. Now, Dr. Bermudez, I just want to ask you a little bit about numbers that have been, um, you know, admitted into the hospital. We've, when we see the spiking, um, I think there was a number reported for maybe three to four hours um, that were, was worrisome um, over the, the weekend. But let's look at some of that and uh, kind of uh, dig down deep with regards to the numbers. Is it that we have quite a number of patients coming in at the same time or within a short period of time? Um, what we have been seeing recently could say um, have three to four admission per day. Uh, sometimes it would be that they come at the same time. Uh, we mentioned about PUI, so we have patients that are in PUI that are waiting for results. So at the same time when the result would come out positive, then they would have to be transferred into the COVID unit. You have patients coming through triage that need to be admitted. So that's, that give us give you a little bit of time where you might have a delay in admitting the patient. Now, before we go um, to a break and we come back with questions from our viewers, what has the toll been like for you um, guys as the team that is actually dealing with uh, the patients that you have for COVID. Um, what does the loss mean, especially for example a 20 year old who's not vaccinated and dies after 21 days in the hospital? It's difficult. Um, we do develop relationships with these patients um, and also we develop relationships with the patient's families. I mean, every day we call to give updates to the families to let them know how their family members are doing. Um, it's, I, when I call, I mean, we, it's a first name basis that you, when you speak to the family. So it is very, very difficult. Um, it is sad and Unfortunately, when a patient dies, we just have to continue and move on to, to the next patient, but it is taking a toll, a toll on everyone who's working on the unit, on the doctors, on the, the nurses. I've seen nurses who break down and cry after a patient, after a patient dies, but then another patient who is critical comes in and you know what, we just have to continue. So it's, uh, it's, been, it's been very difficult for for all of us, we've been in this for the past, I think, year and a half. Um, the sad thing is that now it is something that we can prevent. These numbers, now that we have had the vaccine since March, and I think the the vaccine program was open to all Belizeans in, in June, so there's absolutely no reason why persons should not be getting their 
their vaccine. So it is it's it's sad because we do have how to how to prevent this. Um, a year ago, the medical professionals were being hailed as as heroes, but now there are certain sectors of the society that see us as the as the enemy, as trying to force something down their throat. But I think if they would see what is happening in the unit, well, I would hope, I would at least hope that that would change their their mentality because it is it is sad. The pictures that you see on the news, um, I think it does not, it, what you see on the news, the pictures that you see, the reports that they do, it's just a tip of the iceberg of what's really happening inside our unit and I hope the public um, realizes that. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradley. And with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be for questions and answers. Of course, you can submit your question with the hashtag GetTheFacts. Follow us on Facebook if you're not already doing so. But that's the perfect place for you to send in your questions. We'll take a break and we'll be right back after these messages. No sense at all. No kind of sense. That believes we don't want to have that sign up there in China for. That's not in your China at all. That's in Spanish. You understand why they said it? Yeah. They said wear your face mask properly, cover your nose and your mouth. Well, help prevent the spread of COVID to others. Together we could make Belize safe. Wear your mask properly over your mouth and nose to protect yourself and others. Together, we can keep Belize COVID-19 safe. Looking good, Mom. Hey, guys. I'm off to run some errands. Please tidy up this place. <gasps> no! You guys do it! We got cleaners! Cleaners? You know it, that? Cleaner. It works. convenient and flavorful way to give your immune system a daily boost of vitamin C. Just pop the cap, drop it in water, let it fizz and enjoy. And welcome back to Get the Facts. We're moving into our question and answer segment. And we're still joined via Zoom 
with Dr. Eric Bradley, internist and lead doctor for the KHMH uh, COVID unit. We have Dr. Selma Bermudez, epidemiologist for the KHMH. And we also have Berta Gonzalez, respiratory uh, therapist. So our questions are, how many kids have had severe COVID and what are their symptoms? For the past two months since the, the uh, third wave started, we have seen five, uh, the six weeks, five months, 12 years, 11 years, and a 15 year old. And they all just had a maximum of two days in the hospital before getting discharged. So it weren't that severe. Okay. So we have had five kids so far in during yes. this wave. Yes. Okay. And admitted. And admitted. But yes, that were admitted. Yes. Okay, but you've seen more kids than those that are admitted who are positive for COVID. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's go into our next question. The next question reads: What's the average length of time patients are hospitalized? with severe COVID-19? With severe COVID-19, it can um, range from two weeks, two to three weeks. It, it all depends on the, on the progression of the patient. But we've had patients who have been here um, even for up to a month. And that does not mean that it's, it's going to end badly if they're there beyond three weeks or four weeks even a month? No, I, I actually right now we do we have a patient that's been here for the past three weeks and thankfully he's on the road to, to recovery. He was not intubated. He was on the high flow nasal Canada at very high at a very high flow. Thankfully um, he's he's recovering well, and if, um, if I remember correctly right now, he's only on three or four liters of oxygen, and uh, well on the road to recovery, but he has been here for about three weeks. Okay. Let's move into the next question, which reads, if the ICU is full, do you have to wait for someone to die to actually uh, be treated? If um, the question is referring to the COVID unit, I assume, yeah. Um, like I said, every day we do our best to accommodate. Um, we trust me, we bend over backwards sometimes when we know there's a patient who needs to come in and, and um, get a bed. We bend over backwards to find how to juggle patients, to move patient A to where patient C was and to try to get a bed for a patient. We're, we do everything we possibly can. But um, once again, I need to stress that the situation is dire and we're close to, be, to getting where our neighboring countries are. I mean, whereby there may come the day where we just literally don't have how to move patients and get a patient in a bed. So once again, that's why it's so important um, for persons to adhere to all the measures that, that, that they know about. Okay, let's move on to the next question. It says, how do you know when your oxygen level is dropping? And what is the rate do you measure at, what is the rate do you measure the oxygen level? Okay, um, I would encourage everyone to try to, um, you know, if, if you do have COVID, to try to get a pulse oximeter. And it's a little device that, um, you place on your finger and it tells you how much your oxygen saturation is and your pulse, right? So they basically work um, hand in hand. If, you're, if your oxygen level starts to fall below um, 94, um, then you know maybe it's in the 80s, maybe it's time to come to the hospital. At that point, you will find yourself breathing, what we would say breathing heavy. You know, you, you need to, um, so maybe come to the hospital at that point. You'll feel your heart start beating fast. 
because it's working a little bit more. So maybe it's time to come to the hospital. All right. Let's go to the next question. How many elder persons have died from COVID versus young people? Um, like I said, the age range vary. We have in the past, since it, it turned with, we have had some probably in their 90s who came in and uh, yeah, they suddenly they passed away. And um, it is also, uh, yeah. But the, the, the age range right now with, with this third wave, it's just, it's all over. It's, you know, have no no respect for age. Anybody could be positive, but the, 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 uh, the symptoms also vary. I, I, I guess what, to, to, go ahead, sorry, Doc. I, yeah, to follow up on what Dr. Bermudez is saying, I really find it sad and disheartening that we are seeing persons in their who are 80, 85, 90 admitted to the unit. And these are persons who they tell you, they tell you, and their family members tell you, say, Doc, but I don't go out. But you have their grandchildren, their children who are going out, who are still partying, and they will take the disease form to their grandparents. And we do know, I mean, someone in their in their 80s, in their 90s, the risk of dying from COVID if they develop a severe pneumonia is very high. So it's very sad when the patients tell me, Doc, but I don't go out. I don't know how I catch it. So you ask, what have you, do you have visitors? Oh, yes, my my grandkids come see me. So it, it's, it's, it's sad. It's disheartening. So we still have um, elderly patients who are admitted and, and passed away due to COVID. And I guess a part of the question that they were trying to get at is, and you answered it just now, I guess, Dr. Bradley, that elder um, individuals have a lesser chance of surviving um, COVID if it becomes severe. Or yes, that's, correct. but we've, with the death of a 20-year-old with no um, comorbidities, what does that say um, to you in terms of the numbers as well? And what should it say to the public? What it should say to the public is that, listen, the, the virus has changed. It's not the same as what we were seeing a year ago. Um, we know we do have Delta in Belize. We're assuming that these cases are, are Delta. So the virus changes, the virus mutates the the severity of the pneumonia that we're seeing this year as compared to last year is much worse. Um, last year, it would be rare for us to see a patient who is 20 years old to develop a, a very severe pneumonia. This year, it's something that we're seeing um, twin, persons in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s with no comorbidities who are developing severe pneumonia and these do compensate very fast. Like sometimes, sometimes we have patients who are sitting, talking to me with a couple liters of oxygen one day, the following day they're on a high flow nasal cannula, and the day after that, we need to intubate the patient. So um, the, the, the variant that we're seeing right now, unfortunately, is the patients deteriorate much faster. The variant is um, much stronger. We, we are running into a wall. We're running, running into a wall right now with the severity of the cases that, that we have. Um, once again, persons need to adhere. All right. Thank you, Doc. Let's go on to our next question, which reads, what are the exact symptoms and what's the time frame for a person to catch on and to be alarmed about it? So the exact symptoms can vary. It can be... Um, something like some maybe just a, a sore throat we do have patients who develop respiratory symptoms the cough the dry cough the shortness of breath but also we're seeing patients who are developing gastrointestinal symptoms nausea vomiting um diarrhea you should be concerned when you are 
you feel short of breath, you have trouble breathing, something very important like what Ms. Berta mentioned, um, get a pulse oximeter to monitor your saturations, your saturation at, at, at home. And um, seek medical advice if you are feeling um, short of breath, um, the regional hospitals, the polyclinics, wherever you are, but seek some type of um, medical advice. Okay. The next question, also, we, go also, ahead. Also, we're seeing patient uh, getting, being positive, you know, they, they said, well, all I had is a cold or uh, a little sore throat, but then when they get tested, they're positive. So, the, the symptoms would what we would say mild for some people, but then they're positive. And then, like Dr. Dr. Bradley said, it progressed rapidly. All right. The next question. If you're a mother breastfeeding and is on implants, is it possible to have a bad effect if you have an implant and you're breastfeeding? Does that have a, a negative effect as well? Not, not as far as not as far as I know, to be honest. I mean, I I would need to I would need to ask a gynecologist that question. I'm, I'm really not sure of the answer. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Then it reads as follow: My mom has cirrhosis. I'm concerned because she's very fragile. Can she get the vaccine? Um, it depends on the the level of the cirrhosis. Once again. There are patients that, yes, we do understand from certain medical conditions that um, it's not recommended for them to get vaccinated. So it would depend on the level of the cirrhosis. I would advise that person to, to follow up with their primary health care provider um, to, and determine if, the, if it's safe for the patient to get vaccinated. It depends on the level, how, how, how progressed the cirrhosis is already. Okay. Next question. Is it safe to say that this vaccine is not working on this Delta variant? The studies have shown that the vaccine is very effective to prevent severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. Um, what we do need to be cognizant of is that the if we don't have enough percentage of the population vaccinated, the, when I say vaccinated, once again, I'm stressed that I'm talking about two doses plus two weeks. Um, then the virus can continue to be to mutate, and in the longer run, the effectivity of the vaccine may be a little less than it was originally was. That's why it's so important to get as much persons vaccinated as possible. I think another thing that we should um, consider as well is because um, Doctor had mentioned some of the patients that come were vaccinated, right? Meaning they got their double dose. But um, a lot of those patients were people with uncontrolled diabetes and uncontrolled um, hypertension. So that makes it a little bit more um, challenging in their case, right? So in their case, you could say, it looks like the vaccine doesn't work, but you know, it's because of the underlying issues. Now, one person asked, um, there are still some questions about testing before you're vaccinated. How important is that? Or um, Because that's one of the questions that people have very often. Should you be tested before you're vac um, vaccinated? If you don't have any symptoms whatsoever, there's no need to be tested before getting vaccinated. Okay. One, one, one thing also is like Dr. Brother repeatedly say it's a time because you would see that somebody become positive and they just got vaccinated probably the week before so they're not fully immune so you know we can't use that and say oh uh, the vaccine is not working because I got vaccinated and I am, I am still positive so the time we, we need to uh, take that into effect all right Let's go to another question before we go to break. Do we have enough doctors? Uh, 
Um, no, we do not. We do need it. We need help. We need help. Um, we do need help. The question should be, do we have enough nurses? I think. <laughs> yeah. All right. And if I, go ahead, Dr. Mises. No, I said we need both. We need, uh, because it takes a, a team to, to manage these cases. So we are, you know, the whole country know that Carbridge Night is short of nurses, that we had a lot of nurses that left. So we really need bedside care. Yes, we need to give the, the um, utmost care to these patients. We need doctors, we need nurses. All right, and the final question before we go to break is as follows. Um, it's, we'll take a break, and then when we come back, we'll have our wrap for tonight. Uh, this is Get the Facts. Don't go anywhere. It concludes after these messages with our final uh, thoughts from our panel for tonight. At Belmopan Medical Center, your health matters. Come see one of our many specialists, such as pediatrician, dermatologist, urologist, nephrologist, or orthopedic surgeon. Our allied services include laboratory, pharmacy, nutritionist, psychologist, hospitalization, and operating theater. We provide on-call ultrasound services 24 hours a day, seven days a week using our new venous and arterial Doppler. Get your Abbott ID Now PCR test for only $275 or get a rapid antigen test for only $100. Both tests give results in 30 minutes. Belmopan Medical Center, located on Garbot Creek Street in Belmopan. Give us a call at 822-3179 because your health matters. Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine? The Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is an RNA vaccine that triggers our immune system to develop antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. It helps to reduce hospitalization, severity of the disease, and death. What is the Pfizer vaccine made of and is it safe? The Pfizer vaccine is made up of mRNA messenger ribonucleic acid, which are molecules that carry the genetic information needed to make proteins, lipid, salts, and sugar. It is safe for persons 12 years and older and does not contain the COVID-19 virus, hence cannot cause infection. Tests have shown that the vaccine is effective against current virus variants. Who should take the Pfizer vaccine? The Pfizer vaccine should be taken by persons 12 years of age and older who do not have severe allergic reaction after a previous dose of vaccine or have not had severe allergic reaction to any ingredient of this vaccine. Two doses of the vaccine are required three weeks apart. If you are between the ages of 12 and 17 years, you are required to present a signed consent form before you are vaccinated. What are the side effects of the Pfizer vaccine? Some common side effects of the Pfizer vaccine are headache, fatigue, muscle pain, fever, chills, and swelling at the injection site. If side effects persist, contact your doctor as soon as possible. Does the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine prevent infection and transmission? No, vaccination alone does not prevent infection and transmission. We are still required to continue to wear masks properly, physically distance, wash and sanitize hands often, practice proper coughing and sneezing hygiene, and avoid crowds. I believe 
Women's Diagnostic Center, we offer FDA-approved PCR testing for COVID-19. Get your results as quickly as one hour. Don't risk getting exposed to COVID-19 by going elsewhere. We take appointments or we can come to your home or office using our concierge service with no additional fees. We have 10 locations countrywide. Call or WhatsApp us at 613-TEST. That is 613-8378 to schedule your test today. And welcome back to our final segment for tonight. Of course, this is Get the Fact. And I want to ask the panelists one final question before I give them an opportunity to say their final words. And that question is quite simply, uh, what would you say to someone who is still on the fence about getting vaccinated? First of all, we'd like to apologize for Dr. Bradley. He had to... Um go tend to an emergency okay no problem yeah um well you know back back in the day if you had asked me um what what should i do to um to have good long health i would say well you, you know you wake up in the morning and you do a little bit of exercise you take it deep do deep breathing and um you know but now i really would encourage everyone to try to get vaccinated because um you know, even even if you do get COVID after vaccination, it's not going to be as severe as if you are not vaccinated. So um, if you're a person that is um, on, on, on the heavier side, I should say, maybe, um, you know, you need to consider it because it, it's one of the, the issues that causes complications as well with COVID, right? Um, if you're a diabetic or hypertensive, then, um, you know, try to go and get vaccinated. But um, to the general public, public, I do encourage everyone to go and get vaccinated. Dr. Bermudez? Yes, I, I would say to them, you know, just, just look at the numbers, you know. Before the, the show started, you gave a breakdown of all of the positive cases. And um, if we had, you know, vaccine rollout first of March, you know, we are in September, the end of September. If we have been getting vaccinated, we would have, a, a lot more people would have been fully immune and um, admission would have been less. And the severe, the severe, um, Severity of the COVID, whenever you know you get admitted or you do get positive, would not have been that severe. So, you know, the evidence is there. You know, so I would say just just look at that. Just look at what's happening in in the leads, and you know, go and get vaccinated. All right. Now, panelists, I'll give you an opportunity to say your final words. Starting with uh, you first, Berta. Okay, um, well, I just want to thank you for having us and, um, you know, um, try to keep the, the protocols, you know, um, um, try to stay in, indoors, don't go and, you know, do things that you're, are not really necessary. Try to protect yourself and, in extension, your, your family. All right. Dr. Ramirez? Okay, um, everybody just please just follow the protocol, use your mask, you know, keep your hands clean and sanitized. If you have to be in a room with more than one or five people, make sure it's properly ventilated. Avoid crowd, no gathering, remember social distancing, and please go out and get vaccinated. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, Dr. Bradley had to leave because of an emergency. But we'd like to thank all our panelists from the KHMH, giving us an inside view of what the situation is like at the KHMH 
and how they are manning their response for this third wave of COVID-19. Of course, we want to remind you that tonight is the 20th of September and you may be tempted to have some kind of a celebration. Please do yourselves a favor and your family as well. Take care of your loved ones and make sure that you don't have a party, especially um, an exposed elder members of your family. But we'd like to also uh, put a, as a notice that this is the Pfizer vaccine vaccination schedule for this week for the Toledo catchment. You can go out there um, and see exactly, you have your opportunities the 20, from Monday, today, and then you have Wednesday, 22nd, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And this is for individuals between the ages of 12 to 17. Stay safe and tune in next week, Monday, for another show of Get the Facts. Brought to you through the courtesy of the Ministry of Health and Wellness and this station. On behalf of the Channel 5 family, production crew, everyone here, we'd like to, and the Ministry of Health, of course, and Wellness, We'd like to wish you all the best for our independence, our 40th year of independence. Of course, the ceremonies will be largely on um, virtual, so we encourage you to tune in and stay safe. Wear your mask, wash your hands, and watch your physical distance. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Until next week, I am your host, William Neal. The least is for all of us, and we must do our part to take care of it. Happy Independence, everyone.